Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some familiar faces I haven't seen in a while. Hey, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so many of you know that I love this topic. So I can tell you we're going to have a good time tonight, okay? So any question you have, anything that you need clarified, be sure, hold it, and we'll talk about it afterwards. And get everybody's questions answered. So, in case you didn't know what the topic was tonight, we are talking about bowel and bladder dysfunction, okay? Um, the first thing to know is it's very common with MS. Lots of people have either or both. Most people, because the the pathways are similar, have some of both issues. One may be more bothersome than the other, but they tend to travel together. Um, but you're not alone, so be sure that you talk to your provider, okay? It's a common subject, we've learned about it, don't be shy. When you get that opportunity, ask any of your questions. Now, sometimes you may get one provider that's not comfortable talking about that. But I guarantee you that provider has a nurse that would be more than happy to, to talk with you afterwards about it. So don't be shy. So before we really get into how MS affects the bladder, we're gonna talk about bladder first, then we're gonna to go to bowel. Um, before we get into how MS affects the bladder and what can go wrong, we gotta understand how it works to start with right? And the bladder is a muscle <clears throat> and if normal bladders what happens is as you drink fluid your kidneys you know filter and the bladder fills okay and it's supposed to stretch and that bladder muscle stretches to a point where then it signals your brain okay I'm getting kind of full it's time to start thinking about going to the restroom right? So but your, your, that signal travels up your spinal cord to your brain. And your brain says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we can't do it right here. You gotta wait till I get to the bathroom, right? And then you get to the bathroom, you sit down, and your brain is supposed to say, okay, time to empty. And then your bladder squeezes, and the sphincter opens, and everything works in a coordinated fashion, right? So, then comes MS. So what can MS do to bladders? Well, first of all, it can make a bladder not um, hold as much or send those signals before it's full, okay? So it empties too often, but it empties completely. It may not always be when you want it to empty, but it empties well. The other thing it can do is cause a bladder to not empty well. So sometimes with MS, the bladder can get kind of floppy and start holding too much fluid and you're not getting a signal that, oh, I need to empty until it's way too full and you don't have time to get anywhere. Or some people may never get that signal and they don't know that their bladder's full, right? Um, the other thing when your bladder that can happen to cause your bladder not to empty well is called dyssynergia. And you remember we talked about the bladder squeezes and the sphincter opens. With dyssynergia, the sphincter doesn't open when the bladder squeezes. So your bladder's trying to empty against a shut door. So it obviously has a hard time doing that. All right, so if your bladder doesn't hold enough or it signals you uh, too frequently, so what symptoms would you have? Well, obviously, you have to go to the bathroom very frequently, right? Um, also, it can cause that tremendous urge to empty your bladder. So it's like, you know, normally the urge kind of builds, right? You get a little signal and then it builds as it gets fuller and, and you know, okay, I don't have as much time as I thought I had, I need to get there. 
but with a bladder that doesn't fill properly, it, it's sort of irritable and it sends the signal even when the bladder's not full. So um, then it can, when the bladder's irritable, <clears throat> it can spasm. Many of you have probably heard uh, or experienced bladder spasms and they can be painful. But sometimes the, um, what happens when the muscle is irritable is it just kind of spasms a little bit and you get that leakage, okay? Um, it can wake you up all night long. MS patients tell me all the time, I can't sleep because I get up five times to empty my bladder. Well, that's a problem, right? You got to be able to get your sleep. You have enough fatigue as it is. So um, a lot of times we have to do something about that, especially at night, so people can get their rest. Um, the other thing that happens if your bladder doesn't hold enough urine is that you can't get to the bathroom before it empties. So an irritable, it, it, a lot of people call it keyhole incontinence. Um, and what happens is you're on your way, but your bladder's like, oh, forget this, I'm, I'm going now. Tough, tough tooties, you know? So you have leakage right before you get to the bathroom. Now, sometimes that can be a little bit, or sometimes that can be a lot. Um, but, you, you know, we've all done that dance before, right? And it's like, oh, gotta get there, gotta get there. So I have lots of fun little cartoons I love. This says, urology department, can you hold? <laughs> so, all right, if your bladder doesn't empty well, if it's retaining urine, what symptoms might you have? Well, a lot of times people don't know their bladder, bladder's not emptying well. And sometimes you can go from the symptoms we just talked about, where you're having urgency, frequency, and leakage, and then all of a sudden, you don't know it, but you've transitioned into that um, situation where your bladder's actually not emptying completely and you have no idea of that. And some, sometimes people can feel that their bladder's still full, but a lot of times people don't know their bladder's not emptying until they start getting urinary tract infections. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because that's one of the warning signs that you need to get things checked out. If you're having urinary tract infections more than once or twice a year for women, um, you really need to get it checked out. Men, you should be having even less than that. So, other symptoms, that hesitancy. You know, you feel like you gotta go, you gotta go, and then you sit down and it's like, come on, you know, it doesn't kick in, or it takes a while, or you have to do those tricks that we teach people. You know, turn the water on, put your hand under the warm water. Those are all reflexes that sometimes will help people trigger um, the urine to start. So um, we talked about people not feeling empty, um, but sometimes you have that urgency frequency type symptom and people think, well, I'm just, I need to quit drinking because I just, you know, I, I'm going to the bathroom all the time. And what they don't realize is they're going to the bathroom every time or all the time, but their bladder's just too full. And so we can have or have situations where the bladder overflows and we call that overflow incontinence. Okay, it can also wake you up at night, right? If you don't empty your bladder completely when you do get up, it's not going to be too much longer till you might have another signal that you need to get up. And I've noticed that some people, they have more of a sense of urgency when they're lying down. So um, that's, I think, part of the problem with nighttime, you know, um, nocturia is what we call it, when people get up really frequently at night to empty their bladder. Okay? And then we talked about the overflow incontinence or the leaking that can happen with that. So you should either drink less or expand your territory. <laughs> Those of you who have a dog in the audience know what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, if you have some of those symptoms, what should you do? First of all, tell your provider about it. 
Okay, now there's some situations where symptoms may be mild and they tell you, okay, well, let's watch this, pay attention to this, pay attention to that. You know, if you start having urinary tract infections or you start having more leakage or it starts impacting your sleep at night, you know, until those kind of things happen, maybe we can just watch it and see. And we're gonna talk about some, some lifestyle things that you can do yourself to help the symptoms if you really don't want to pursue uh, further treatment at this point. So, but you need to tell your provider because we need to um, be aware and assess how that's going because if it gets to a certain point, it really needs to be evaluated further. The other thing is watch for sudden changes in your symptoms, okay? You, you know, you can have MS relapses that um, have symptoms of sudden bowel or bladder dysfunction. So people will come in and say, I've never had this symptom before, and all of a sudden I do, and it may be that they're having a relapse. So that's rare, but it happens sometimes, so pay attention to how long the symptoms have been there, when you notice they're worse, you know, all of those kind of things, or if they change in their um, presentation, okay? So what would we do about it, all right? Um, first of all, the first thing we've got to see is which category are you in? Are you in the category that empties too much and your bladder's irritable and we need to calm it down and then everything you know, might happen more coordinated? Or are you in the category that you're not emptying your urine? Then, so the, the treatment of those things are different. So there are a lot of tests we can use to figure out which, which um, category you're in. So the first thing we need to do is measure how much urine's in your bladder, okay? Um, and we do that after you empty your bladder. Now there may be cases when we don't do it at the, you know, in that sequence, but most of the time your provider would say, go to the restroom, come back and we're gonna check how much urine's in your bladder. Now luckily, it, most uh, MS providers have access to what we call bladder ultrasound. And it's just, you know, squirt the jelly on your abdomen and you rub that wand around and it tells us how much is in your bladder, okay? Um, so that's an important test because we can tell if your bladder's emptying completely. Sometimes people will be carrying around a little bit of urine and we'll monitor it over time because that post void residual isn't too high. Um, if they're not getting infections, we may monitor it. So that's something that, that your provider may do actually uh, multiple times to monitor you. Your provider may say, you know what, let's send you straight to a urologist, somebody who can evaluate this and tell us if what we need to do, um, if it's an, uh, <clears throat> figure out which problem it is and if there are medications or treatments that we can do. Um, back in the day, before I uh, started working with MS and with Dr. Thrower, I did pelvic floor muscle therapy. And there are still uh, therapists and, and nurse specialists that do that. And what it involves is basically teaching you uh, how to use those muscles again and reconnect kind of your brain to those pathways that empty your bladder. So they may refer you to that. They may tell you some lifestyle things to try first before they do anything else. Um, they may offer medication. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that because it's really important to um, be able as a, a patient to tell what the medication is doing because it can make matters worse if you're uh, not careful. So, um, your, your provider may say, you know what, you're not empty in your bladder and this is a dangerous situation and we need to talk about catheterization. So, um, those are things that may um, be recommended. So the first thing when, when, you know, when I say all those things or we talk about all the things that, that go into making bladder dysfunction better, people are like, oh my gosh, can't I just take a pill? Well, 
Sometimes, yes, you can just take a pill. But if your bladder's not emptying, most of the medicines that we use are medicines that relax the bladder muscle. So if we give you a medicine that relaxes your bladder more and it wasn't emptying in the first place, then all of a sudden people can't empty their bladder at all or the pressures go up to their kidneys. Your kidneys filter into your bladder um, in a low pressure system. So your, your body is not meant to function with a full bladder and it can cause kidney damage over time. So we wanna make sure that um, we're not making matters worse with medicine. The, you know, the other thing people say is, do I really have to use a catheter? And, um, you know, that it depends. And a lot of times, yes, people have to catheterize. Um, and if they don't, some people say, well, you know, I, if I can live with this, why do I have to catheterize? And, and the thing is, that over time, it can damage your kidneys and lead to things like dialysis and kidney failure. So we definitely don't want that to happen. So it's important that we address the situation appropriately. So um, urinary tract infections, first of all, you, anybody in this room with MS that's had a urinary tract infection knows that that's miserable, right? Um, it makes you feel like you're having a relapse a lot of times, you're miserable. Um, the thing, you know, if you happen to have a fever, that's even worse. You know, usually people with MS, when they have a bladder infection, a lot of times they don't have the immediate symptoms that they may have had before MS affected their bladder or the, the symptoms that someone without MS may experience, like the pain with urination, um, the burning, the uh, lower back aches and pains. You know, sometimes they don't have that until later on, until the infection's really bad. Sometimes the first symptom is that they have more muscle spasms. And it's this weird thing the body causes or can react to a urinary tract infection by making your muscles more stiff. And we see this with spinal cord injury, and it has to do with the neurological system and what's going on. So sometimes, especially for patients who have muscle spasticity anyway, I tell them to watch for that. If they think um, you know, their spasms increase suddenly, then we need to make sure that it's not a, a urinary tract infection. We talked about the kidney damage. We definitely want to avoid that. And one of the things that you may need over time is a yearly uh, kidney uh, ultrasound to make sure that there's no damage there. And then it really impacts quality of life, right? I mean, you guys, all of you that have experienced this problem can tell me where every clean restroom is on your way from your home to this hospital. Personally, I love a quick trip, okay? They got the crushed ice and the clean bathroom, and, you know. I, but anyway, it's, it's a quality of life thing. And what I see is people um, stop doing things they want to do because they're afraid they'll have a bladder accident or a bowel accident. Um, and we don't want that, no. We want you to be able to manage this so you can do what you want to do, love to do, and, you know, um, and get on with life. So, okay, if your provider sends you to a urologist, what would a urologist do? Okay, now, it, the caveat is it depends on the urologist, okay, definitely. And it somewhat depends on what your symptoms are and what they feel like the issue is. But a good history is really important. So if you've been referred to a urologist, you wanna be sure that you kind of have in your head what your symptoms are, what's bothering you the most, how um, do you have leakage or not? Have you had infections or not? What is your goal? What do you want? Um, and I know as a provider, a lot of times I appreciate it if a patient says, 
you know what? I don't want a medicine. Don't, don't even, let's not even go there because I just want to know what else I can do for this. So if you're one of those people and you want to try something else first, say that up front. If it's a situation where you really need to consider medication, then they know to talk to you about the pros and cons of that. But also, they may do a pelvic exam or a prostate exam for men because sometimes with MS and when you're getting older, your prostate can also cause problems that look like MS. So got to check that out. Women, when we have hormonal changes as we age, and if we've had those babies, they've been sitting on that pelvic floor muscle for nine months and it tends to thin it out and, and cause some problems over time. So a good pelvic examination will really help figure out what's MS, what's hormones, what's, you know, all those babies. So um, they may do renal ultrasound, cystoscopy, urodynamics. So um, I know probably many of you have had a urodynamics study um, before. And I'm going to be up front, not a fun thing to do. Okay, nobody would say, it's kind of like um, neuropsych testing. You know, nobody's gonna go do that by choice because it's fun, right? It's something that it may be necessary to do. So um, they may recommend some video or urodynamic studies, and we'll talk about what, what information that will give you. So Botox injections are now approved for MS for that urgency frequency because Botox relaxes um, or semi-paralyzes a muscle, okay? So, but you need to have a really good evaluation because if your, again, bladder's not emptying well and you give it Botox, it's not going to empty at all, and that's a big problem, right? And then there's implantable stimulators that um, so are appropriate for some people. So video urodynamic testing or, um, can tell us all those things we talked about, all those steps of how a bladder empties. It can tell us how much your bladder can hold. It can tell us when you get the urge. Is it you know, way before it should be or is it way after it should be? Is your bladder signaling you properly? Then it can tell us how strong the bladder muscle is, how well it's squeezing. It can tell us the pressures in your bladder. Um, it can tell us if that sphincter's opening or not. So all those things are super helpful, especially um, if, so if you're considering medications to target those different things. So, okay, so there are medicines that can help. Most of the medicines are, with, are bladder relaxers that, that calm that irritable bladder, okay? So um, these are some of them. There are new ones coming out all the time, ones that you may, you know, some people respond to some and not others. Some people, one, one thing to think about that I think a lot of times we don't talk to folks uh, about is the extended release versus the, the quick acting, okay? Some people only they really don't want to take a medicine every day for their bladder. The, the biggest issue for them is that they can't see a movie or they can't go out to dinner because every 15 minutes they're going to the restaurant. Um, or maybe it's just the sleep issue at night. So for some people, a short-acting bladder relaxant on an as-needed basis is what, they, um, what fits their uh, situation the best. Now with the extended release versions, the, the good thing is those you only have to take once a day and it lasts the whole day, but you can't use them on an as needed basis because it takes a while for them to get in your system. So um, you really have to st st um, stay on that regimented schedule. So, but those are things that when you're considering medicine, you, you can talk to your provider about and just know that there are different versions available. Now, the common side effects with these medicines, dry mouth, um, constipation, um, sometimes it can have some cognitive, uh, you know, symptoms and such. So, um, 
it's important to, to be sure that you're aware of what, you know, what might happen if you're trying one of those medications so that you can report that to your provider. Now there are some, like the short acting version tends to have a little bit more side effects because it's in your system quick. Whereas the extended release versions or the patches, they have patches that are available, they uh, tend to have less side effects because it's a slower acting medicine. So those are things that we talk about when we're considering what medication may work. So the Grinch's small bladder grew three times that day. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so what can you do if you're having symptoms, all right? Um, there are, we call them lifestyle changes, but they're basically things that you can do that you have control over that can possibly help the situation. So if you have urgency frequency, that irritable bladder, you need to know what makes that worse, okay? There are things that you mainly you know, fluids that you drink that can irritate the bladder. There are some foods, you know, sometimes people will have more symptoms with spicy foods or such. Um, so caffeine, alcohol, you know, aspartame, um, those are all bladder irritants. If you're constipated, your bowels are all wrapped around your bladder and elbowing it all the time, so that makes it worse too. Right? But the biggest thing that irritates a bladder that people don't um, think about is concentrated urine. So when people have the urgency frequency, the first thing they do is stop drinking, right? They're like, okay, if I gotta go to the bathroom all the time, I'm just not drinking anything all day. Um, and what they don't realize is there's a point where that makes matters worse. Um, so if you don't have enough fluid on board and your urine's real concentrated, your bladder's gonna be more likely to leak, okay? Those spasms are gonna be more intense. Now you may not have to get up and go to the restroom as often. Um, sometimes you have to go more, it just makes it worse. So just know that you have to maintain an adequate fluid intake. Now, my colleagues around the country have differing opinions about how to do that. The, the saying is, if you sip, 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 you drip, drip, drip. And, but I, I kind of, there are some people that I disagree with that. I think some people do well sipping because their bladders aren't gonna hold two bottles of water in 15 minutes, right? Other people, they can drink their fluids at, at mealtime well, when they're close to a restroom and they know in 30 minutes their bladder's gonna empty or whenever, and then they can go about their business, right? So it, it, you have to kind of know what kind of person you are, what tends to affect you more, but the, the key is be sure you're getting adequate fluids, okay? And adequate, you know, I tell people gradually increase it. Don't go from one bottled water to 10 a day, you know, gradually do it, but, but measure your fluids. Now the other things on the list, it's not that you can't have those. You can have alcohol, um, you can have caffeine if you like your coffee in the morning. Just don't get on 85 before you've emptied your bladder, right? Because it's, be, it's gonna be a problem. So just time those things. If you're gonna have them, be aware of what the, the result may be and just be near a restroom so you can do it. Um, timed voiding is a trick we tell people. If, um, you know, if you're one of those folks that have leakage before you get to the bathroom, Go ahead and set your schedule, okay? Just go ahead and know that I need to just go ahead and go to the bathroom every two hours, you know? Or you may be an hour person, you know? Um, but put it on a schedule. Um, some people, we can start them, you know, at, at 45 minutes and go to an hour and then slowly get, uh, get their bladder used to holding more. So that's a trick that we may try with folks if their bladder is a tiny, stiff bladder. Double voiding is a great trick for people whose bladders don't empty well. And it's funny because it, people do this instinctively, you know, and when I start telling them, they're like, oh, I do that already. 
So it's interesting, but double voiding, so when you sit down and you empty your bladder, if you're one of those people who retain fluid, then you stand up, wait two seconds, and sit right back down. Nine times out of ten, it'll start again and empty what's still there. Okay, and then you can gently put your arms over your abdomen and rock back and forth. It's generally not a good idea to press really hard on your lower abdomen because if you put too much pressure, then again it can, can back up to your kidneys and cause an issue, so be careful with that. Pelvic floor muscle exercises. Women in the audience know what a pelvic floor muscle or a Kegel exercise is, right? Men tend to not be as exposed to that. So, but basically, your pelvic floor muscle, your bladder sits on top of your pelvic floor muscle. And your, your pelvic floor muscle is part of that sphincter that's supposed to open and relax. So sometimes over time we get the connection to that muscle uh, confused and lost and we forget how to relax that muscle and how to use it to squeeze really tight so that we don't leak before we go to the restroom, right? But what people don't realize is exercising that muscle also can help um, calm the bladder down. So there's a technique that, that pelvic floor muscle um, therapists can use where they teach you to squeeze your pelvic floor, breathe deep and relax, then go to the restroom. And you tend to have less of those last minute ex, uh, uh, accidents. So. so, all right, you're having urinary tract infections. Why can't I just call the doctor and get a prescription for an antibiotic? Are you kidding me? Right? <laughs> Admit it. We all think that. We don't have to go to the doctor if we don't want to. So the problem is when you have a bladder issue with MS, a lot of times what happens is your bladder becomes colonized with bacteria. So your bladder gets used to there being more bacteria there. So then your bladder, um, when it doesn't, the infections doesn't, don't respond to the antibiotics in the same way. So if you go to your primary care doctor and you say, uh, you know, I've got an infection. Okay, somebody without MS and bladder issues, they would give them three days of an antibiotic and it should take care of it. But somebody who has MS and has this bladder dysfunction may require a more complicated regimen and may not respond to the first line antibiotic. So that's where the culture comes in, okay? If, the, um, if you get treated with an antibiotic without a culture, you know, there are cases when we, when we do that. You know, there are some times when people just don't have access to do a, a culture, but it's much more efficient um, and better for you if we know exactly what antibiotic your infection's going to respond to. Because we've all been on two and three rounds of antibiotics before and gotten all those bad side effects and, you know, everything. So you, and you want to be sure you're, you're not getting resistant to uh, antibiotics and then not be able to, um, <laughs> to respond appropriately. So, all right, so let's get on to bowels, okay? So, Normal bowel function. Now you think after the years we've been on this earth, we would understand all the factors that go into having a bowel movement. It's amazing that there are still things about that we don't understand. And really, I think we've got a better handle on bladders than we do bowels. So it can be really tricky. And, but the normal bowel function is a lot like normal bladder function, okay? Um, it's a little more complicated, but basically, you know, you eat food, it goes through its process and enters the intestines, and then your intestines have that gradual uh, wave 
um, of motility that's supposed to move that whatever it is cheeseburger down to the appropriate end right um, so when it goes through all of that it gets to the rectal vault and when the um, rectal vault is kind of like the bladder a little bit when it feels it stretches and it signals your brain okay got some action down here need to go to the you know restroom and then your brain says wait hold up you know i'm in walmart i'm not going to go in that bathroom <laughs> um so you should be able to say hey hold on wait a minute now if you're not getting that signal okay you know and it sits there too long that's when things get really um tricky and we'll talk about that so there's also the the sphincter mechanism that's supposed to relax and then you're you you actually have a normal kind of use of your your um, muscles to evacuate your bowels so you use your stomach muscles a little bit and and positioning is really important with um, emptying the bowels so all right so the most common problems with ms constipation or fecal incontinence and we're going to talk about both of those um, constipation it amazes me when i talk to folks what they think a normal you know bowel function is um, now we all have our patterns you know there are those of us that are once a day or twice a dayers then there are people who usually are every other day or every third day um, but if you're having two or less bowel movements in a week then we need to work on that okay that's where you get into the constipation uh, range if you go every day but it's just hard stool okay that's constipation too we need to work on that it shouldn't hurt and take a earthquake to come out right so um, and if you have to use medication to have a bowel movement every time if you you know we need to look at that make sure the the right medicines are are in use bowels are creatures of habit okay and the medicines are very stepwise and so if you start with the most powerful thing or number five on the list you just wiped out four things that you could have used for a while and, and gotten too close to the end where there may not be those things to help you. So we want to be sure you're starting at the level that is least risky for you. Fecal incontinence. So um, this is a more complicated issue because a lot of times it really involves lots of potentially different things. So we know a lot of people have an irritable bowel and then when you add MS onto that then you know you've got two things working against each other. The other thing may be the medications that you're on might cause problems. Um, the food that you're, you're eating you may have sensitivities or allergies to the food so that plays a part. So a lot of times if people are having fecal incontinence I may be quicker to send them to the GI doctor to rule out all those other things so we know that uh, what we're dealing with is is mainly MS so so what causes constipation or what MS can do to cause it so motility gets slowed down if you're not drinking those fluids because your bladder's acting up then that can cause constipation you know, moving around actually helps that cheeseburger go from the top to the bottom. So if you're not as mobile, you're more at risk for um, constipation. Medicines, we talked about the bladder medicines that can cause constipation. Um, and just like with the bladder, you may not get the urge or you may be ignoring the urge, which can then cause issues. So what can you do about constipation? Well, the first thing I tell people is let's regulate your fluids. Let's make sure you're getting a lot of fluid, okay? Then fiber, okay? Fiber is tricky. If you're not taking in enough fluid and you add fiber, 
it's going to make your constipation worse. It's cement, okay? You got to have enough fluid, so you absolutely have to do those together. And so some people will do their fiber on a day they're going to be in the car and they know they're not going to drink their fluids. Don't do that. If, you, if you're not going to drink your fluids, don't take the fiber, okay? But try to keep it on a regimented um, schedule. So stool softeners can be helpful. And then just establishing a bowel program. We talked about time voiding. We do that with bowels too. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So keys to success. Use your gastrocolic reflex. So your gastrocolic reflex is when the bowels increase in the motility and it's 20 to 30 minutes after you eat a meal. Now, some people can vary, but and people, some people are morning people and some people are evening people. So you may have more of that reflex at, at a particular time of day. So maximize that. If your breakfast and that coffee usually get you going, then every day go in, have a seat on the toilet, and let things happen, okay? Positioning is important. I'm still upset that I didn't invite in, uh, invent the squatty potty because I've been telling people for years to get their knees above their hips, and I could have been uh, very well situated if I had just... But anyway, squatty potties are great, okay, whatever you can use, but get in that position. Which brings me to a story I love to tell. Some of you may actually recognize this little gentleman who is now 10 years old and would die if he knew <laughs> this was on the screen. However, okay, when he was potty training, I was like, oh, I got this. I'm bowel and bladder queen, okay? I know all I got this. And then he would go to school during the day, and he'd go to the restroom, and he'd come home, and he would not have a bowel movement. And it just aggravated me to death. And so every night, before, I said, you're just going to sit on that potty till you have a bowel movement. You've got to, you know. Well, one night it was, usually I'm doing the bath and in 15 minutes I'm like, okay, listen, if you're not going to go, you got to get in the bathtub, right? Women, we're like, we, we got things to do, okay? Men take a little longer. They have a magazine, you know? They, and, and I have to admit that they're on to something, okay? The saying is, if you sit, it will come. And I realized with my son, I was rushing him. And that night when I let him sit on the potty for 25 minutes and read his book, it happened. So sometimes just going to the restroom, taking your magazine and relaxing will get your body in that habit. So that's my little story. Um, so fecal incontinence causes, we talked a little bit about the, the, you know, different things that can cause that. One thing you need to know, if you get really constipated or you have um, a blockage in your bowels, what happens is your body starts trying to flush that out, right? So all of a sudden you start having diarrhea and you're like, oh, I, I you know, I got to get some Imodium or something. And then you end up in the emergency room or the hospital with a bowel blockage. So you need to pay attention if you go from constipated to having diarrhea, wait, you may need to just flush your, your system through and get that out. If you don't have any results, you may need to go have an x-ray or have somebody evaluate you because it can be a serious issue. So pay attention to that. Some people, it's rectal sensation. They don't know when the rectal uh, vault is full, and so they don't have the appropriate response. That There are ways to, to figure that out. Diet, that usually, diet and fluid is the first thing we try. You know, a lot of people have sensitivities to lactose or some other, you know, different dietary things. So we look at that. Um, I have patients do a bowel diary sometimes. Um, you know, tell me what they're eating, what they're doing, and, you know, how often they're going and all those juicy details. So um, medications can cause the issue. And then that sphincter dysfunction can happen with bowels too. Now the pelvic floor muscle it, your, your, um, your rectal 
uh, vault goes through that too. So that's part of the sphincter mechanism for that as well. So pelvic floor muscle therapy may be something that helps with that. So the treatment for fecal incontinence is we start with the same treatment we start with constipation. We get people on a regimen, okay? We figure out what their normal was and we try to reproduce that as, as best we can. So I usually will have people do something to initiate a bowel movement every you know, day or every other day or every third day based on their history. So again, um, medical evaluation to rule out other issues can really be helpful. Sometimes if people have a really liquid stool, we do something called fiber load. And we talked about how fiber can, can you know, slow things up. Well, with fecal incontinence, sometimes we can regulate the stool consistency with fiber and help people have better control of their bowels by making it a little firmer. All right, I think that's it, thank y'all.